Good evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to see so many people here for the event. Uh, I've been told very clearly the first thing I should say is, can you please switch off your cell phones? So uh, if, if you could check so that uh, they certainly don't ring while our main speaker is talking. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here this evening and to be able to say a few words before the lecture and uh, it's particularly nice to see a good turnout despite the tropical rain for a storm outside and uh, the I have a particularly soft spot for the Leakey Foundation and for the Leakey Lectures. Uh, I, my name is Bob Martin and I was a curator of biological anthropology at the Field Museum and I retired at the end of 2013. And uh, way back, uh, 10 years ago, there was a leaky lecture at the, field, at the uh, Peggy Notabert Museum, uh, organized by the executive director, Cheryl Camisa, who is here. And I went to that lecture and uh, got hold of Cheryl as soon as I could and said, why don't we have these lectures at the Field Museum? And she very kindly invited me to Shaw's Crab House for dinner, along with the speaker and a few other people. And from that one evening, two things emerged. First of all, a leaky lecture series at the Field Museum, which lasted for six years. And secondly, my love for Shaw's uh, Crab Restaurant, which is my favorite restaurant in Chicago. Anyway, the Field Museum uh, hosted uh, 11 leaky lectures over a six-year period. And unfortunately, that series came to an end in 2012. And so behind the scenes, I've been uh, talking to a number of people, including uh, Janice Bell Kay, who is an advisor to the Leakey Foundation, to see whether there would be some way of getting the series moving again. Unfortunately, the Field Museum decided to get out of what it calls adult education. And so there was no chance of re-establishing the series at the Field Museum. Uh, but very luckily, uh, a new partner uh, eventually came on the scene, the Chicago Council for Science and Technology, C2ST. And that institution was, or that organization was founded in 2006 and uh, is a wonderful new newcomer to the scientific scene in Chicago. Its aim is to do whatever it can to promote science and technology in the Chicago region. And although it's only been in uh, operation for 10 years, it's organized over 100 different events and has cooperated with 80 national and regional organizations. And so uh, it was a, an ideal partner in many ways, and I kick myself for not thinking of it earlier uh, myself. Um, but in fact, what happened in the end is Chester uh, Kamen, who is a trustee of the Leakey Foundation, uh, but also uh, involved with C2ST, um, put the two connections together. And that's how we come to be here tonight with uh, uh, a new leaky lecture, and I hope this will be part of a, a new series. Eventually, we built up to about 300 people who came regularly to the leaky lectures at the Field Museum, and it would be nice to get back at least to that level again. Uh, I want to say just a couple of words about the, the two organizations behind this. The Leakey Foundation in uh, California uh, has the mission to increase scientific research and public understanding of human origins, evolution, behavior, and survival. And it does tremendous work in providing grants to enable particularly younger investigators to conduct uh, key studies. And quite often that uh, kicks off major studies that come uh, in its wake. And 
the other organization, C2ST, uh, which uh, has the mission to enhance the public's understanding and appreciation of science and technology and their impact on society. So these are two ideal partners to get together, both extremely vigorous, and the leaky lectures are run in other cities, uh, and they've been very successful uh, across the board. And so I very much hope, as I say, that this will be a, the start of a new series here in Chicago. And if you want to learn more about either organization, uh, you can learn about the Leakey Foundation by simply typing in Leakey Foundation as one word, dot org, O-R-G. And if you want to learn more about C2ST, then uh, you can uh, visit uh, c2st.org. And so uh, I would strongly recommend that you look up both organizations. As I said, as C2ST organizes a lot of events here in the Chicago region and has done a tremendous amount over the decade of its existence to further science in the Chicago region. Anyway, without more ado, I want to hand over to my uh, colleague, uh, Janice Bell Kay, who worked with me for several years at the Field Museum, and uh, she will introduce tonight's speaker. So welcome, thank you all for coming. We are so happy to have the Leakey Foundation back in Chicago. It's been, um, it's been a long haul, but we're really pleased that tonight was going to happen. As human beings, we're deeply interested in our origins. We want to know who we are, how we got here, how we got to be the way we are. And so, therefore, uh, looking to our closest relatives is one way to inform that inquiry. Tonight's lecture is going to be a real treat. Melissa Emery Thompson received her PhD in biological anthropology from Harvard in 2005. She is currently co-directing the Hominoid Reproductive Ecology Lab at the University of New Mexico and uh, also teaching. Dr. Emery Thompson's primary research is with the Kabali Chimpanzee Project in Southwest Uganda. There she conducts behavioral and biological research on wild populations of chimpanzees using innovative non-invasive procedures. Melissa has been recognized widely for her research as well as for her teaching skills. She has also been widely published in journals too, num too numerous to list, including the International Journal of Primatology, American Journal of Physical Anthropology, and the Journal of Human Evolution. Melissa, we are pleased and honored to have you here this evening. Please welcome Dr. Melissa Emery Thompson. Thanks so much for the, the kind introduction. Um, and, and thank you especially to the Leakey Foundation for inviting me to speak today. Uh, Leakey, Louis Leakey really was influential in the origins of great ape research, of course, through his mentorship of Jane Goodall and others. Um, he was, uh, the Leakey Foundation is continuing to be one of the key uh, funders of great ape field research. Uh, they funded part of my dissertation research, they funded some of my postdoctoral work, and they're continuing by funding some of my students. So this is, this is a really important uh, event for me. So Leakey understood that his fossils, while they could provide a lot of information about things like anatomy of our human ancestors, they were limited in, the, in their ability to provide inferences about behavior, and particularly about social behavior. So Leakey also understood that we should be looking to our closest living relatives in order to develop and test models uh, about how hominoids must, might have behaved prior to the evolution of the genus Homo. Chimpanzees have gained particular relevance for this mission uh, because of their close genetic relationship with humans, but also because they exhibit some behaviors that were once thought to be unique to humans. 
So when I was about 12 years old, my mother came home with a big stack of National Geographics that somebody had left at work, and it included this 1979 issue with Jane Goodall's report on the first 17 years of her research at Gombe. And she described some really extraordinary things. This was one of the articles where she talked about the warfare that had occurred between communities. She talked about death and disease, about struggles for power within the community, about infanticide. But what really struck me was this spread uh, of the individual social roles that different chimpanzees played in the community. Uh, and Goodall highlighted in particular the roles of matriarchs in the community um, and how their relationships with one another developed over the years of her study. And one of them was named Melissa, so that was really exciting to the 12-year-old me. Um, <laughs> So at the time, I wasn't particularly aware that real people could actually make real careers out of doing what Jane Goodall had done. Uh, but 15 years later, I found myself at Gombe with her chimpanzees. And Melissa, the chimpanzee, had unfortunately long since died. But I met her son, Goblin, and I met her daughter, Gremlin, and I met a bunch of her grandchildren. And I met some of the field assistants that had worked with Jane Goodall. And they actually called me Mama Gremlin in honor of one of their favorite chimpanzees. So uh, that's how I got here. So I've called this talk The Secret Lives of Female Chimpanzees, not just trying to be provocative. Um, in fact, when I went to do my dissertation research, I found that there was really not a whole lot written about the lives of female chimpanzees um, and, and other female apes as well. And the most remarkable thing that a lot of articles had to say about them uh, was that they weren't very social. So you see uh, quotes like this. You can read it, but I'll read it to you as well. Generally, social bonds among females may, if anything, be passive aggregations based on physiological homogeneity and activity occasioned by similar age, maternity, sexual receptivity. We can also state that females gather in the process of trying to follow adult males. A female gathering is generally an accidental aggregation rather than a unit based upon clear principles of grouping. So we see a lot of statements like this about the other female apes as well. Um, and Nishida here was no dummy. He was, in fact, one of the most influential researchers, aside from Jane Goodall, uh, to, to describe the social organization of chimpanzees. So, you know, there's reasons to take his comments seriously. Uh, but overwhelmingly, research had focused on the ostentatious behavior of males in this group, about cooperation and the vicious competition that occurred between the males. And uh, female social roles were generally dismissed as being confined to motherhood or their sexual attraction to males. So in a lot of ways, we're going to see that this isn't that far from the truth, but it ignores the complexity that those kinds of roles can entail and the potential functional aspects of the social strategies that females have, even if they're not particularly strongly expressed. Um, and, and the lack of clarity on the social lives of female chimpanzees is a little bit surprising, because as we know, uh, chimpanzee field research was really begun <laughs> by Jane Goodall, by a woman, and all the, the uh, great ape uh, field sites that were started by women. They weren't ignoring the behavior of female chimpanzees. And beyond that, primatology in the 1980s and the 1990s uh, was at the forefront of what's called Darwinian feminism. And there were a number of really prominent female scholars that were out there overturning these long-held assumptions about the passive evolutionary roles of females. So I think that there's really not any kind of sinister thing going on with the lack of information, uh, but perhaps female chimpanzees really are just difficult to understand. So I want to talk to you today about the inroads that we've made in the past a couple of decades in understanding just what's going on with female chimpanzees. And I'd like to, to argue that we shouldn't start and end with the observation that they're not very social, but we can learn a lot about them and about us by trying to figure out why. So I'm going to start by kind of walking you through what chimpanzees do all day and what we do all day when we're studying them. 
Now, I work with the Kibali Chimpanzee Project, which was founded by Richard Rangham in 1987. Uh, and I can't do my research without this really huge team of collaborators, which includes three fellow directors, a field director that's based in Uganda, a really big field team of uh, chimpanzee trackers, snare removers, that kind of thing. We have Ugandan students that we support, and then we have visiting students and researchers. So these visiting students and researchers, some of whom are here, um, are the ones who go out and do really focused short-term studies uh, on the behavior of the chimpanzees. But we really rely on this Ugandan field staff to maintain the daily observations. Uh, and so they, they go out every day and have done so for about the past 30 years uh, and monitor, uh, they keep the chimpanzees habituated, they monitor their daily social behavior, feeding behavior, ranging behavior, and the like. And what that means is that when our students go out to do their field studies, they plug into a system where all the chimpanzees are well identified, where their relationships with one another are really well understood. So this means they can go out and do really fun, innovative new stuff without having to reinvent the wheel. Our field project is located in the Kibali National Park, which is in southwestern Uganda. Kibali is a really great forest for primates. It's, it's very dense with primates. And there's at least 1,200 chimpanzees in this forest. So we studied the Kanyawara community, which includes about 60 chimpanzees at any given time. Uh, there are several other long-term research studies in the park, uh, where ours is the longest running. The Kanyuara chimpanzees live in a home range that's about 25 to 30 square kilometers. So it's a, it's a huge area. And that's probably necessary in order that that number of chimpanzees can find food year round. But it's also got to be small enough that that number of chimpanzees can effectively defend it. Uh, chimpanzees live in what we call a fission fusion society. So while most primates you'll find that live in groups, uh, individuals spend the majority of their time uh, in close pro proximity to one another. Or if they don't do that, then they come together at a common sleeping place. Uh, whereas in a chimpanzee community of this size, uh, the entire group is rarely, possibly never, all together in one place. Uh, and the reason is fairly simple. Uh, chimpanzees like to eat ripe fruit. It's over 60% of their diet. And a fruit tree generally doesn't feed that many hungry chimpanzees at one time. So we'll find um, at any given time that our chimpanzees are spread throughout this huge area in parties of various sizes. The parties tend to be larger uh, at food patches that have more food in them. They'll be larger if they're sexually attracted, attractive females around. Uh, but, it, but we sometimes spend hours trying to track them. You can, you can walk for miles and miles sometimes and never hear uh, or see a chimpanzee. Um, and we have to collect data on whoever we can find. Uh, so you can't choose an individual to find that particular day. You kind of have to take it as it comes. Uh, and in order to try to get around that problem, we, d we follow what we call a nest-to-nest -nest schedule. Uh, so chimpanzees build nests in the trees at night. And our, our observation team will follow them until they get to those nests, record the location of the nest, and then give that information to the next morning's team. That team will then leave before dawn to try to get the chimpanzees before they come out of the nests. They then select a focal individual and try to follow that, that individual all day. They, observe, or they record everything they eat, where they go, everything, everyone they associate with, and any other interesting events. So for the past 18 years or so, one of the more important parts of the daily data collection routine has been the collection of biological samples. So we're not contacting our chimps. We can't take blood samples from them. So we use gravity uh, and collect urine, sometimes feces. And my major role in the project for, for this uh, last uh, 15 or so years has been to coordinate at the collection and analysis of these biological samples. And I'm proud to say that our research project has become particularly well known as an innovator in this area. And it's become an increasingly common method in primatology. 
It's also been called one of the worst jobs in science. Uh, uh, I don't agree <laughs> with, we have a slight risk of getting weed on, of course, at any given time. Um, but we can use this, these samples in order to monitor reproductive function, uh, nutritional and energetic status. We can look at stress, disease, genetics. So it's really abundant uh, source of information. And our project to date has collected over 30,000 urine samples from this group of chimpanzees. We've also collected uh, several thousand fecal samples. So people uh, often are still puzzled by how we do this. Um, one of the convenient things about chimpanzees is they are a lot like humans, uh, and so when they wake up in the morning, they like to urinate, and before they go on a trip, they like to urinate. So we can anticipate pretty well and be there with a little plastic bag. We only need a few mils of urine, a few grams of feces, uh, so it's really, um, People get actually really excited about doing it. Uh, kind of a game. Uh, most of the chimpanzee, chimpanzees' day actually is pretty uneventful. So they're like most animals in nature, and they spend most of their day finding and eating food. And um, when they're not doing that, they're digesting. Uh, so we spend a good fraction of our day just sort of craning our necks, looking 50 feet or more up in the tree, trying to keep track of which individual is which. Um, but when they, they come to these trees, they can get really excited about the food crop um, and make a lot of noise. They, when they see each other uh, for the first time in a day, they spend a lot of time uh, kind of greeting each other or, or displaying um, and jockeying for position. And once they're full, they come down and get out of the sun uh, and sit here on the ground and have social time. So this is when we see a lot of grooming, uh, we see a lot of playing, a lot of napping very uh, calmly with each other. And one of the benefits of having studied these chimpanzees for so long is that they're very well habituated and they don't mind that we're down there with them. Um, now it's important that, that you understand that we never directly interact with our chimpanzees. So we, we keep a distance of five meters at all times and that protects them, it protects us, and it, it mostly it makes sure that they're gonna do what they wanna do without us bothering them. So most uh, primates are seasonal breeders. Chimpanzees are not seasonal breeders. Their menstrual cycle patterns are uh, very, very human-like. Um, so at any given time, on any given day, you'll, you'll have maybe one, maybe none, maybe several females in the fertile part of their cycle. Um, and unlike humans, they have these very nice genital swellings that signal their status. So males find these super exciting. Um, for their part, females attempt to mate with all the males in the community, um, as many as possible, as often as possible. And that seems to be a strategy that they can use to try to convince every male they've mated with that they have a possibility of siring the offspring. And that way, when the offspring's born, none of them are motivated to hurt it. Male chimpanzees have really interesting relationships with one another. They compete with one another on a regular basis, especially for access to those females. Uh, but they also spend ample amounts of time cultivating the bonds with one another. Uh, and male chimpanzees cooperate in a number of different contexts. Um, one of the most important functions that they have is for territorial defense. Uh, so the males as a group will uh, patrol the boundaries of that big home range and try to make sure that there are no outside males in there trying to mate with their females or eat their food. Um, their if they actually find um, strangers, they're known to attack and even kill those strangers. Um, and their success in doing this and in not becoming vulnerable to the other groups depends very much on having a numerical advantage. So being good friends and trusting the other males in the community is, is really important. Males spend a lot of time solidifying their relationships with one another during, uh, with grooming, um, and pairs of males will form alliances that can last for years and that help them out when they're competing with other males. Uh, these two guys um, are really old friends, and so they spend a lot of time just sort of sitting, staring into each other's eyes and delicately grooming each other's faces. Now, in comparison, females are less actively social. They tend to avoid being in big parties, especially around all those rowdy males. 
And so they spend a lot of time foraging by themselves or with their offspring. When they do join larger groups, they spend less time engaged in sort of actively social things like grooming, particularly with each other. Uh, so what this graph shows you is the distribution of same-sex pairs according to the amount of time they spend in close proximity to one another. The black bars are your males, the gray bars are your females, and so you can see that there's one or two pairs of females that have kind of strong relationships, but that as a general rule, the vast majority of males are better friends with one another than the vast majority of females in the community. Females also spend less time fighting with one another. So now if you're a primatologist, grooming and aggression are the way, ways that you quantify and understand social relationships. Um, so what I'm showing you here uh, is a dominance matrix. Uh, this is sort of primatology 101. It's kind of like a competitive bracket. Um, and this was uh, generated during a two-year study of the chimpanzees at Gombe. Um, the little numbers on the left, uh, sorry, the little numbers are going to show you the number of times the individual on the left won a dominance interaction with the individual along the top. Uh, so there's, in this two-year period, there were 72 total interactions, of which only 17 could actually be called aggression. So that's not a lot. Um, you can actually see that most of the dyads that they looked at never even had an interaction, so it's very difficult to tell who is higher ranking than, than someone else. Um, if this was calculated for male chimpanzees, or for female baboons or female macaques, there would be hundreds of observations over that amount of time. So like I said, this is one of the major tools that we have to understand relationships. Uh, so these kinds of data, which uh, were very hard won by this researcher, can be really frustrating. And we can contrast them with the sister species, bonobos, where females develop very strong, hierarchical, affiliative, even sexual relationships with one another. Uh, females will actually form strong alliances to defend each other from attacks by males. And in most bonobo communities, it's actually a female who's the most dominant individual in the community. And I want to just emphasize that, that what I'm saying here is that females are not completely disengaged from the social world. They're clearly capable of being social, and sometimes they seem very highly motivated to do so. Uh, so that's a bit of a, a puzzle why they aren't social more often. Now, I'm an academic. We understand that having a social life is kind of a luxury. Um, so uh, this, you know, maybe females just simply face too many costs and perhaps too few benefits for, for being social. Also, their status relationships, even though they're very weakly expressed, seem to have real, real significance to their fitness. So this is data for Gombe, which is the same community that yielded that really thin dominance matrix. Um, in Gombe, a female rank has significant effects on fitness. F high ranking females have higher birth rates, and higher infant survival. Uh, the graph that, that is here is showing you that high-ranking females have an 80% chance that their offspring will survive to age seven. For low-ranking females, it's only about a third of them. So in my research, I've tried to go back to the basics. If female social life really does just revolve around their offspring, what is it that determines their success at motherhood? And in my early work for my dissertation, uh, I did a big study. I went to three different chimpanzee communities to test the hypothesis that food availability affects female fertility. And this research was based upon really excellent work by Peter Ellison and all of his students. Uh, which demonstrated in sophisticated ways that conception in humans is, is extremely sensitive to diet and exercise. So we kind of know this intuitively from some of the extreme examples. A lot of people have heard that ballerinas, for example, uh, often have delayed menarche, or that marathon runners often miss a lot of menstrual cycles. Uh, it hasn't completely filtered into our popular culture because you meet a lot of women who are trying to get pregnant and on a diet at the same time. Um, 
So Ellison's earlier studies looked at runners in the US, and they found that moderate recreational running lowered women's fecundity, so it lowered their probability of conceiving on any given cycle, uh, even if they ate enough to maintain their body weight. Now, if they went on the running regime and lost weight, they had even more severe impairments. And, and in that category, only 25% of the women had regular ovulatory cycles. So this translates really nicely to, um, to the natural situations in human societies where uh, food availability isn't consistent year round or where there's seasonal uh, increases in workload. So for example, uh, Polish women who work on farms for their, for their food uh, experience menstrual irregularities in association with the harvest, even though they're very well fed, they have plenty of stored food, so they, the workload seems to affect them. And women in undernourished communities, such as in rural Nepal or in the forests of the Congo, uh, experience seasonal reproductive dysfunction in association with the hunger season. And they also have much lower fecundity than women in Western societies, like the US. So the nice thing about these studies is that they used hormones in order to assess the impacts, the short-term impacts of variation in diet and workload on fecundity. So the, these researchers uh, found that estrogen and progesterone, uh, two ovarian hormones, had strong impacts on the probability of conception, but they didn't have to wait around for the babies to be born. They also didn't have to deal with a lot of confounds to, that, to counting babies, which include, for instance, the Polish farmer women may just have been too tired after all that work to have sex. So we use these kinds of uh, methods to study fecundity in chimpanzees. And the long story short, we found uh, support for all the same kinds of models that were developed for humans. Uh, variation in diet within individuals, across individuals, between communities, between the wild and captivity uh, had strong effects on reproductive hormones and on fertility. So for example, when uh, there's a lot of fruit available in the community, uh, female chimpanzees can conceive really quickly within a month or two. Uh, but when there's uh, very little fruit available, they can cycle and have sex many, 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 many times uh, for a year or more before they conceive successfully. Now one of the interesting things about uh, the organization of chimpanzee communities is that not everyone has the same access to food. So when the territory is really large, and remember, our community ranges over more than 25 square kilometers, we find that females tend to stay into smaller neighborhoods uh, instead of using the whole area. So males, these are, each polygon is, is the home range of a particular, or rather the, the, the ranging pattern of a particular individual. So you can see that males use the whole area. Um, and of course, males are patrolling the boundaries, so that's not a surprise. They don't have little kids with them, so they can probably move around a lot more easily. Whereas females use smaller areas of around six to 10 square kilometers, still pretty big. Um, they can range over the whole area. We can find them elsewhere, um, but they tend to confine most of their activities to these smaller areas. Now their core areas overlap with one another, so we call them neighborhoods. So at Kanyawara, we have two major neighborhoods of females, one in the center sort of towards the south and one to the north. So in these diagrams, the red squares, the redder they are, the more likely that particular group of females is to be found in that location. Um, the blue areas indicate places that they're very unlikely to be found. So you can see basically the opposite pattern for these two neighborhoods of chimpanzees. But this is where the fruit trees are located. So the greener patches are the fruit trees. And you can see that they're distributed pretty much in the central area. There's a little smaller concentration up in the north. You can see why somebody might want to live there. But it's definitely not as nice an, an area to live in. Um, so it turns out that the females that live in that, that rich central area produce higher levels of estrogen and progesterone. 
They have higher birth rates, like much higher birth rates by a couple of years. Um, and their infants are more likely to survive to reach maturity. So if we put all those statistics together, it turns out that the central females end up with reproductive success that's about twice as high as the females in the north. So this really leads us to a puzzle. If food matters that much to your reproductive success, why are females not fighting over it all the time? <laughs> Um, and why don't we understand their dominance relationships in, in relation to access to the, the food? If they were a typical monkey society, something like a baboon, we'd see fights all the time. Um, and females in these baboon and macaque societies have really rigid hierarchies uh, based often on their, their matriline that are reinforced with regular interactions. And I think the answer might have something to do with having to negotiate such a huge area. So if you can kind of imagine that there's a really great farmer's market like all the way across town, you can probably imagine that. Um, it might not always be worth it for you to make that big trip out there, uh, particularly if you're not sure if they have what you need or maybe the locals will have bought all the good stuff already. You know, sometimes it might be better for you to stay home, shop locally, even if there's not as good selection or it's not, not quite a, as good of quality. But you don't have to fight the crowds. You don't have to spend the time and gas to get there. Um, so we kind of think this is what's going on with our females. Um, even though the food isn't as abundant up in the north, they know where it all is. And they don't have to fight with as many individuals in order to access it. They also save energy by not traveling as much. But how did they end up there in the first place? So in most animal societies, one or both sexes leaves the community when they reach reproductive maturity. That's just so they can find somebody to mate with that they're not related to. So in, in chimpanzees, it's the females that do the emigrating. So soon after they have their first menstrual cycle, the females will leave. Sometimes they seem to shop around and come back. Sometimes they just go. Sometimes they stay, not very often. Um, when a new immigrant enters the community, she's faced with a really important decision of which neighborhood she's going to settle in. And we've seen that that has really strong consequences. Um, I think it's important for us to understand, though, when they do this, they don't necessarily have complete information. They don't have a, you know, a fact sheet on what, what the crime statistics are in this particular neighborhood. But what they do uh, quickly get a sense for is how friendly the neighbors are. So um, males, you might not be surprised to learn, are pretty excited to have them. <laughs> and they typically come in with one of these sexual swellings. Uh, and males, males are very happy. Uh, Nishida, who I quoted earlier, called the swellings a passport. Uh, because they allow uh, you know, freedom of movement as long as it's displayed. But the females in the new community now have a new competitor they're not so excited about. So as it turns out, when a new female tries to enter a community, all hell breaks loose. Uh, we looked at, at rates of female-female aggression uh, during a period of time. We had a long stretch of time when no new females came in the community, and we saw fights, uh, and by fights, I mean any kind of aggressive interaction. So this includes mostly threats and chases, which we might call arguments rather than fights. Sometimes they slap or bite each other, and rarely anything worse. So we were seeing this about once every 200 hours. Then we had a new female, Nile, who entered the community, and the rate of aggression doubled. And then a few years later, we had a stretch where there were two or three immigrants in the community at any given time attempting to find a place to settle. Uh, and now we had aggress aggression about every 25 hours. Uh, so you know, per individual, that's once every two days of awake time. And when we looked at who was instigating the aggression, we found that aggression was given by the resident mothers against the new immigrants. And it was specifically these mothers over on the right who are the females living in that really good neighborhood that were giving the attacks to the immigrants. 
Uh, so this might have the result of making females who aren't willing or able to contend with this kind of conflict to settle in the less high quality neighborhood or to leave the community entirely. Um, at Gombe, they've actually observed females trying to emigrate and, and encountering aggression so severe, being attacked so severely that they, they just went home and stayed there. Uh, and at Badongo, uh, which is also in Uganda, uh, they've actually had immigrant females have their babies attacked and killed by the resident mothers. So, you know, the aggression uh, doesn't occur very often among female chimpanzees, um, but it can be uh, really severe. So they're not fighting over every meal, but over which supermarket they have access to. And it turns out that when we actually are able to discern what their ranks are, it's the females in the high quality neighborhood that tend to be higher ranking than the females up in the north. Now, when we think about male dominance relationships or the kinds of dominance relationships that characterize females in a lot of other primate species, uh, frequent squabbling might have to do with being around one another all the time. Uh, it could also be the cause. Uh, so uh, by having frequent low-level conflict, you can sort of tolerate and, and live with one another by reinforcing your relationships. Um, it's, it's a way to help prevent having more severe fights. But in the case of, of our female chimpanzees, their major strategies appear to be to avoid your rivals if you can, or aggressively exclude them from your social world. And this combination of strategies, while unusual, probably has uh, fewer risks than some alternatives in this kind of an environment. So um, Joyce Benenson is a nice colleague of mine in, uh, at Emanuel College in Boston. And she studies uh, child development, um, particularly the development of sexual, uh, sorry, of sex differences and social behavior. And she's often really emphasized that the differences she sees in, um, in children's behavior between the sexes closely mirror what we've been describing uh, for chimpanzees. So there's, there's kind of a common misconception that females are the most so, more social sex in humans. Um, and Benenson has found a lot of evidence to the contrary. So when presented with stimuli uh, of groups of individuals, in this case puppets, uh, infants as young as six years, uh, six, sorry, six months of age, prefer to interact with the trio, the group of puppets, as opposed to the single puppet. Uh, females exhibit a much uh, lower preference for the groups. And when they get to elementary school, uh, if you ask kids to form groups, girls will tend to form pairs, and boys will tend to form groups of three or more. And in a lot of different studies, Benenson sort of forced these girls to, uh, to interact in groups of three. And they responded typically by pairing up and excluding the third individual. So what often happened is that they would have a toy and exclude the third girl from playing with the toy, or they would tell secrets about the third girl, or they would even verbally denigrate the third girl. Girls also reported having fewer friends in their social network and getting less enjoyment out of their social interactions. Not surprising if you're the third girl. As teenagers and as young adults, uh, women are more likely than men to permanently end friendships, particularly over minor things, uh, and they show less tolerance of same-sex individuals than males do. Um, and at the same time, girls of various ages were more reluctant to compete with one another, and they had more discomfort if they were put into a competitive type situation. Uh, they preferred to ostracize other females if given the chance in an experiment rather than to compete directly with them. And despite being more competitive, males also show a greater tendency to reconcile with one another following a conflict. So there's a brand new study that just came out. Uh, Benenson collaborated with Richard Rangham, who is the founder of our Kibale Chimpanzee Project, and looked at videotapes of uh, 
highly competitive sports events from, uh, involving participants from 44 different countries. And what they found was that following these events, men engaged in longer frequencies of uh, friendly contact, reconciliation type behavior. They were also more likely to make conciliatory gestures towards their opponents than female athletes were. And one of the remarkable things about it was that, that it was the boxers, the, uh, the people who were doing competition that's most like an actual fight that showed uh, the biggest sex difference compared to things like badminton or tennis. So we tend to think of conflict and cooperation as being exactly the opposite thing. Uh, but in both chimpanzees and humans, it's males that are comfortable with having competitive and cooperative relationships with the same individuals. Um, whereas competition in females tends to be handled indirectly via exclusion or avoidance of your rivals, and it's less compatible with cooperating with those rivals later. So rival females aren't the only social problem that chimpanzee females have. Uh, for these new immigrants, I mentioned that males are really excited to have them around, uh, but the charm wears off pretty quickly. Um, male behavior be starts to become kind of imped an impediment. Um, they're the more gregarious and competitive sex, so they tend to be really rowdy. Um, even if they aren't directing these kinds of displays and things at the females, it can interfere with their behavior. Uh, so our field director, Emily Otali, has found, for instance, that females are much more vigilant about their infants uh, when there are adult males around. Uh, we've also found that even when food abundance is, is really great, uh, males have a negative impact on female energetic condition. So the, what I mean is that females, uh, when they have spent the month uh, in larger groups of males, they have lower levels of a marker of energy balance in their urine. Um, the number of females didn't have any effect. So it's not just having more bodies around that, that affects energetic condition, but it's something particular about the behavior of males that seems to be interfering with their ability to forage efficiently. Um, this same marker of energy balance uh, also strongly predicts reproductive function in the female. So this is pointing to a real clear cost of being in social groups. Beyond that, males engage in a number of direct attacks at their females. So our uh, Kanyawara chimpanzees gained some notoriety in Time magazine uh, for the brutality of some of these attacks. They actually used these uh, branches as weapons to beat females with. This is something they haven't ever been observed doing against other males. Uh, we noticed a few things that were interesting about their aggressive behavior. First of all, they were more likely to attack uh, females that were cycling, and particularly females that have those sexual swellings. Bless you. The more sexual excitement the females seemed to garner from the males, the more likely they were to be attacked. Um, and uh, second, in, uh, individual males targeted particular females for their attacks. And even though they were more likely to do this when the female was sexually receptive, they often continued to be aggressive to the very same females outside of that period. So given the association with mating, we started to think about this behavior as possibly being a really unfortunate sexual strategy of the males. Now, you may have heard about orangutans where, where males often force females to copulate with them. This doesn't happen in chimpanzees. We've had uh, you know, maybe three observations of that uh, over uh, many, many years at many, many sites. Uh, so they're not forcing females to mate with them. Uh, instead, this seems to be uh, harassment and intimidation and sometimes punishment if a female strays too far from a male who's trying to, to mate with her. So we found that males had higher mating success with the females that they were aggressive to. And since different males were aggressive to, to different females, this couldn't be explained really easily by something like dominance rank 
or that females may just like the robes. Uh, that doesn't seem to be a very good explanation for the results we have. Um, we found that aggression not only uh, made it more likely that a female would give in to a male's solicitation for mating, uh, but it also made the female more likely to approach the male and solicit mating herself, especially when she was ovulating. Uh, so this all suggests that males are using aggression to intimidate and kind of condition females uh, to not only to mate with them, but perhaps more importantly, to mate less often with everybody else. And there was a recent study from Gombe that used paternity results and again, a wonderful use of feces. Um, and they found that males had a higher probability of siring the offspring of those females that they were most aggressive to. So one of the more interesting things about that was that it wasn't the losers that were using coercion. I mean, these weren't males that didn't have a chance to mate themselves. Uh, through sort of more conventional means. Instead, they found that the uh, highest ranking males, the ones who were already getting a competitive advantage, uh, had a higher likelihood of using this strategy effectively to secure a paternity. So we see clear costs for females of associating with males. Uh, while female reproductive function is sensitive to energy, uh, associating with males is energetically costly. And females, well, they need to associate with males in order to mate with them. Doing so uh, causes uh, increased stress. And we actually found using stress hormone levels uh, that, uh, that the aggression that, that re females receive from males is one of the strongest predictors of stress hormones. And this, by the way, is one of the trade-offs uh, for those females that were living in the high-quality central area. You know, because they live where all the food is, that's where males show up. So they tend to be around males more often, and it turns out that those females have higher cortisol levels than the females living up in the north. Uh, so it suggests that perhaps they, uh, they regularly experience costs associated with, with that. So in humans, we of course do see persistent harassment, intimidation, and the like across societies, but we also see really important ways that men and other members of the community actively contribute to the reproductive welfare of women and their families. Um, Paul Hooper and others have done really nice work uh, looking at the uh, flow of resources through human foraging communities. They found that male hunters in particular are able to secure many more calories uh, than they consume. And they give these calories not only to their children, uh, but also to the mothers of those children. So in that way, they're contributing not only to the, uh, the health and the survival of their own kids, but they're contributing to the birth rates, to increasing the birth rates of the women. And in chimpanzees, we're seeing exactly the opposite. We're seeing that, that mothers are similarly reliant on energy to reproduce, but males are, are, are causing a problem. They're actually detracting from their ability um, to reproduce. Okay, so in more recent years, we've turned our attention to infants and juveniles. Uh, we've been doing a number of studies on development. And one of the questions that arises is how these reproductive strategies and the effects of the social world on females affect the health and well being of their offspring. Uh, we were able to devise a method for estimating lean body mass, muscle mass. Uh, using urinary markers, and we use this to look at growth in our, our kids. Remember, we can't trap them, we can't weigh them, so this is really kind of the only way we can get at this question. And one of the things we wanted to know was whether mothers that are in better energetic conditions, such as the females that are in that central neighborhood, whether they have offspring that grow faster. And in fact, we found uh, exactly the opposite. The females with higher energy balance had smaller offspring, which is weird. Um, the reason for this seems to be because mothers with, uh, with more energy were able to conceive again more quickly. That meant that their first infant would be weaned earlier, so they got less nutrition. 
And so this uh, graph is showing you the relationship between uh, the size of one of the chimpanzee juveniles and the interval to the next sibling's birth. So the quicker that next sibling was born, uh, the smaller that first infant was. And these uh, kids stayed smaller throughout their juvenile years, so it wasn't a short-term effect. Uh, in, in biological circles, we tend to think of this um, as a quality quantity trade-off. So if you have more offspring, you can't invest as much in each of the offspring, but you increase the probability that, that some of them will do well. You sort of increase the number of lottery tickets that you have. Um, we tend to think of quality, uh, the, the selection of, of the quality strategy and investing more in the quality of each child as being the strategy of the wealthy, kind of high resource, well-nourished mothers. Uh, but in this case, it was actually the mothers in better condition, the, typically the high status central neighborhood mothers uh, who had more rapid reproductive rates. That meant they weaned their babies earlier uh, and those, those kids stayed very small. And unlike human mothers who can easily take care of more than one offspring at a time because they have help and they can store food and cook food and all that other stuff, uh, this doesn't happen in, in chimpanzees. So a female chimpanzee can't afford to take care of more than one offspring at a time. Nobody's helping her do that. So what are the effects of this? I can, I can give you one a uh, really sad example of this. Uh, this is, uh, on the right, is Olympia, who's an infant that was born in 2014. She was born to Utamba. Utamba is 37. She's had seven infants, which is really remarkable for a chimpanzee. And most of those infants have done pretty well. Um, she's had these infants. She, her average interval between two births is three and a half years. And the average for a chimpanzee in the wild is five and a half years. So she's doing this really fast. Um, so Olympia was born in 2014. In 2015, there was a lot of food. The chimpanzees did really well. And Utamba got pregnant again uh, when Olympia was only a year and a half old. Uh, now, I have a student named Chris Sabai who's out there. Well, she just came here for this conference. But uh, she's been out there studying uh, play and development of these kids, uh, she's found, uh, funded by the Leakey Foundation. Um, and she started observing that Olympia was getting really lethargic. She stopped playing. Uh, she has all these siblings, so they were constantly trying to get her to play with them, and she didn't want to. Um, she was crying a lot. She would, uh, she would attempt to nurse, and, and that's what's shown in this picture here. You can see Olympia uh, making kind of a, a suckling face. And so Chris started to notice that Olympia was sitting uh, near her mother, very close to the nipple, but not actually making contact to the nipple uh, and making the suckling motion. Uh, and then she would start crying and screaming really loud. We could hear her and find the chimps by the sound of Olympia's tantrums. Um, so uh, eventually uh, Chris observed that, that Olympia was uh, having one of these tantrums. Her mother picked her up, tried to move through the trees, and Olympia couldn't hold on, and she fell out of the tree and died. Um, so we can't say for sure that Olympia's death was caused by the fact that her mother had a, got pregnant again too soon, but it was very clear to us that, that Olympia wasn't producing breast milk for her anymore, um, and, and that Olympia was really suffering in terms of her uh, level of energy and so forth. So uh, in conclusion, uh, you know, there are a lot of ways in which the story I've told you suggests that, that Nishida was right after all, and females aren't the most dynamic social actors in their community. They spend a lot of time caring for their offspring. They do their best to coexist and minimize the costs of living in their social world. Um, but I don't think I would call them passive, and I certainly don't think I would call them antisocial. Uh, instead, uh, they seem to be making sophisticated decisions about their social world in order to deal with all the various pressures that they encounter from the other individuals around them. 
And the role as child bearers offers them more risks and probably fewer rewards than for the males that they live with. I think it's also important to remember that females and their offspring really are the gravitational core of a community um, and all the other crazy stuff that happens in orbit around them. Um, this is the legacy from which human families have evolved. Um, indeed, in most human cultures, it's still the case that the economic and social roles of women, while they vary quite substantially, still revolve around caring for their children. Um, and arguably, most of the other fascinating cultural and political stuff that happens in human communities centers on making sure that core social, uh, that core caregiving unit functions effectively. Um, or at least that's, that's how evolutionary biologists like to look at the world. In a lot of ways, I think there's not a whole lot that's changed about that core role uh, in, in, in our evolutionary history. But what has seemed to change are the kinds of constraints and benefits of females to interacting with the rest of their social world. Um, this has been enabled by various kinds of technological and cognitive adaptations that give us better access to resources and help enable more cohesive kinds of communities. Uh, so human uh, females seem to have made a lot of progress, if not uh, complete progress, in solving a social dilemma that's been handed to by our evolutionary relatives. So thank you so much for your time. And I'm told there's plenty of time for questions. I think if you want to ask a question, you need to come down to Chris here. Really? Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I was curious about what are some of the determining factors that um, allow some of the uh, emigrating or immigrating females to withstand um, the aggression of the higher society females um, versus, you know, going off to the more peaceful northern area? I wish I knew. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. So um, we were starting to look at, at things like body size now that we have this new measure um, in order to determine whether you know, bigger females have uh, a more success. Sometimes I think it's um, random opportunity. So we've noticed that uh, new immigrants sometimes manage to get in after someone's died and left a spot. Um, it may be the case, and we, we, we need to test this more thoroughly, it may be the case that coming in uh, as a pair is a, is a more effective strategy. And sometimes we see uh, two females coming in uh, at a relatively the same amount of time. They seem to spend a lot of time together, and, and maybe that helps. It's something that's been observed in, in gorilla populations that, that females will actually move together and, and are able to kind of withstand some of the competition. But we really don't know. Um, it's, it's, and I imagine that some of it comes down to personality. Thanks. Hi. Um, my understanding is that uh, f uh, food sharing among males is connected with uh, sexual politics and getting access to females. And so I'm wondering, is there food sharing among these females? And if so, what's the function of that food share? So food sharing is something that's often been talked about in chimpanzees. And I, one of the things I can emphasize is how rare it is. Uh, so um, males do, when they hunt for monkey uh, and for other kinds of meat, they tend to share somewhat grudgingly <laughs> with one another. And, you, and you're absolutely correct that, that there have been some studies linking uh, that kind of sharing with other, with other kinds of bonds and with sexual access to uh, among the male, so the alpha male will reward his friends and others who've been nice to him. Um, it's also been argued that um, that sharing to females may uh, increase the likelihood that a male will mate with females. Uh, and, and there's increasingly evidence against that. In fact, males very rarely share meat with females. And when they do, it's because the females have begged and begged and begged and begged. <laughs> um, so amongst themselves, uh, I've female 
females rarely, rarely share food. They rarely share food with their own kids. So once, once they've weaned them, they're not, they're not giving them food. They're tolerating them, but uh, food sharing is extremely rare. Thanks for the question. Uh, Olympia was the little chimp. So when she died, did her mother mourn? Oh, <laughs> um, her family was around. They, um, her siblings came over and, and tried to, to play with her and, and sort of rouse her. She, she died pretty quickly. Um, they, as far as I was told, they, they stayed around for a couple hours and then left. Um, so we do see, we do see sometimes that mothers will carry their dead infants for, for days at a time. Um, and some people interpret that as, as being mourning. It's, it's really hard to tell. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, do they have language or something like it? And if they do, are there differences between male and female chimp language or communication? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> communication is not my area of specialty. But uh, in terms of the kind of natural vocalizations that they use, um, one of the more common vocalizations is a pant hoot. That's a kind of, I'm not gonna do it for you. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's a really loud vocalization that, that groups of males often do. Um, it seems to be a way to communicate between the parties across distances. They do it when they get really excited. The males are more likely to do it together if they're good friends. Uh, so there's, there's certainly a bonding aspect to that. Now, females pant hoot, but they don't seem to do it as often, and it sounds different. Um, and in fact, individual pant hoots sound different. Um, so to the extent that that addresses your question, I guess we don't know what information they're getting out of that. Uh, so it, you, know, you, could, you could think of it as something like language. You're not going to give me control. <laughs> um, I wondered, um, is there any actual evidence that, that the females are receptive to many males because they want the males to believe that, the, that all of the males to believe that the, the offspring is theirs? Because I know in, in some human societies there was uh, no understanding at all that the, that the sex had anything to do with pregnancy. So that um, even as recently as, as um, a few generations ago in Australia, the, the Aborigines didn't have that concept at all until they were colonized by the British. So it just seems to me to be not possible for the, for the chimps to, to think. I mean, how do you know that they think that? <laughs> I mean, they just, that just may be, you know, it's fun, let's do it more than anything else. That's a good question. Um, so in, in chimpanzees, uh, this hasn't been studied systematically, but in a number of other primate species, uh, they've found that, that males are uh, more likely, for instance, to attack an infant if they haven't mated with the mother or they haven't mated with her very often. Um, and, and in chimpanzees, there have been more anecdotal kinds of, of evidence that it's, it's often females who they encounter on the periphery of their, of their home range that they, they attack and often kill those babies. Or females that live in the community that haven't been around much uh, may have their infants attacked. Um, but it's, it is a, a pattern that we see across uh, primates that when females have uh, a lot of males that, they're, that are likely to come into contact with their infants, they will mate a lot with them. And, and the evidence in, in chimpanzees clearly points to maxim, maximizing partner diversity. So as soon as possible, they mate with everybody. Um, and they will continue to do so and, and mate hundreds of times before they conceive. But also keep in mind that chimps have that big swelling. So they're, they're sort of telling males, now, now is a good time. They're giving males a much better indication uh, than, than human males ever get about whether they've made it at the right time. Other question? You need to go here. They want to record you. <laughs> Thank you.
Can't take it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is about the dominance uh, hierarchy. I'm curious, you know, we see a lot of dominant stuff in the bonobos and, uh, and in humans too, adolescent humans. I wonder what your idea is, what your theory is, why we're not seeing much, or if there are other ways that dominance hierarchies are being created other than in uh, physical confrontations. Among these females. Um, it's still kind of a mystery. Uh, one of the, the things that we've been able to, to do in looking at the dominance ranks, now you need, you need several years of data in order to, to calculate them, uh, but our study and the Gombe study have now decades of data, so, so we've started to look at this. And one of the things that we find is that these, these relationships uh, are remarkably stable over time. Uh, so despite the fact that, you know, Leah and Niall may not fight on a daily basis, their status relationship relatives to one another stays the same year to year to year. I don't know how they do that without, without kind of constantly reinforcing them. Um, one of the things that does seem to associate with dominance rank in every community that's looked at it is age. So the older females get, the higher ranking they are. Um, that's all I can tell you, I guess. We also don't know, for instance, whether the females that are in that central area uh, are there because they're higher ranking or whether they're higher ranking because they live there and you know, have better resources and all that. I'm over here. Can you just pass in the front, Chris? I've been fortunate enough to be in Kabali as a, as a tourist. Uh -huh. And while I was there, um, there were a lot of chimpanzees over our heads. And uh, at one point, one of the chimpanzees decided to pee all over me. I'm sorry, <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> and I wondered if they're just habituated to seeing humans and humans want to collect the urine. <laughs> <laughs> or is it like we would do in our culture and say that they were just pissed off that we were there? <laughs> Uh, I don't believe they have collected urine much from that, that site that you visited with uh, the tourist community. So I doubt they were trying to do it on purpose. But I've certainly had that happen. I've certainly had, uh, especially little kids that will position themselves over me and then urinate a little. And then when I move, they kind of wiggle over and try again. Um, so yeah, maybe they were just messing with you. <laughs> maybe they didn't like your outfit. <laughs> Thanks for the question. This will actually be a lot more convenient if you guys can make a line for the questions. I'm sorry to have to say that, but if I start having to run around, it's... Uh... This is amazing. We were at the Brookfield Zoo years ago with my son, and one of the chimps there were going around from the urinating on people above, below. We observe that in, two, in the Brookfield Zoo. I think they're bored. Hello. Hi. Thank you for the wonderful <clears throat> lecture. Um, you referenced um, a study of human children, boys and girls. And I just wonder if you can address the concept that um, this may be, how much of this may be nurture rather than nature, and is, it a, is this a study that has uh, replicated itself across different cultures? Thanks, that's a really good question. Um, the, you know, the fact that we see inherent preferences in just looking at puppets, 
in infants as young as six months of age suggests that there's at least some kind of, of attraction to groups that's, that's more likely in males as, a, as, a, you know, as nature. But it's absolutely the case that, that we reinforce all sorts of social norms with our kids. Uh, that type of work, to be honest, I'm not sure that it's been replicated in other, in other societies outside of our own. Um, and, and I'm sure that that's, uh, that's something that they would, they would like to do. Um, the student that I mentioned in my talk is doing a study with our chimpanzees trying to get at that. So uh, she is looking at very young infants and she's recording what they look at. So she's particularly interested in whether they are, for instance, if, if male infant chimpanzees are more likely to look at aggression and if they're likely to look at it for longer than female infants are. Um, and the extent to which they use that information to play. So we have, we've had a recent, um, recent finding from this research uh, that suggests that after infant chimpanzees watch an aggressive interaction, they're more likely to hit each other when they play. Um, so, so we're looking at this in more detail, and the real goal is to try to understand all the different kinds of input that lead to sex differences in behavior by the time these kids are 10 or 12. So are they inherently looking at different things when they're very small? Um, how do their play styles differ? How does that change with age? Do their hormone levels affect this? So once testosterone kicks in in adolescent males, how does that actually shape the sex differences in behavior? Um, and she wants to be able to, um, Ideally, she'd like to, to see influences of both a sort of natural sex differences and, uh, and experience, but chimpanzees don't mold the behavior of, of their offspring in really noticeable ways. So, so this is a system where we're not gonna have active teaching and active reinforcement of social norms for boys and girls. They still might experience their social worlds in a different way and be exposed to different kinds of behaviors does that answer your question? Thank you very much. Oh, you, I think you've mentioned that um, young chimpanzees will ride on their mother's backs for like years. So after they get kicked off mom's back, do you know, do their levels of glucocorticoid distress hormones increase? Good question. I don't know. <laughs> so they... Um, they typically, if the, their mother doesn't have a new baby, they, they tend to stay in very close proximity to her uh, for four or five years, which is usually about when they get weaned. So a lot of these kids, like Olympia, got weaned a lot earlier than that. Uh, so we're in the process of trying to understand what happens not only with their behavior, but with their general health, their activity, their play, uh, when that kind of thing happens. Um, but chimpanzee kids are like human kids in the sense that, that when they're weaned, they don't just go away. They stay around their mothers uh, until they're eight or 10 years old or even later. Uh, so I think I forgot what the, what the question was. <laughs> but oh yes, the stress hormone level. So yes, that's something that we're in the process of looking at. And we had a really interesting complication, which is they, they start peeing a lot less around the time of weaning. <laughs> they're, not getting, they're not getting water through the, the breast milk. So they start peeing less. That means we're not getting really good coverage about what's happening with things like their stress hormone levels during that process. <laughs> what are the factors that influence an individual female to emigrate? And are they usually accepted into the first community that they try to join? That's a great big question uh, that's really difficult to answer because most research studies only study one community. It takes a lot of effort and money to track this one. Uh, so the neighboring communities are kind of a mystery. Uh, this has been done uh, at Gombe. At Gombe, they have three communities that are under various levels of observation. So they have seen some females leave one community and show up somewhere else. Um, as for what affects uh, their success in doing that, um, there's not a whole lot I can say. 
Uh, one thing that we have found is that they uh, are most likely to leave when, they, um, when they've experienced several months of really good food. So they seem to stock up and leave when they have when they're in pretty good condition. And if you think about it, they're going off to no man's land <laughs> to try to find a new place to live. They're going to encounter competitors. They're not going to know where any food is. So that seems to make a lot of sense. Um, it, some females don't leave or leave and come back and stay. Uh, we've had three of those now, females that have stayed. And they've all been uh, daughters of high-ranking mothers. And at Gombe, that's what they observe as well, is that if, you're, if your mother is very high ranking and she, ha she lives in a really good neighborhood, that decreases the chance that you'll actually leave the community. So I think what happens is that they shop around. And if, you're, if your situation at home is better than anything you can find, stay home. Um, but the other thing we have observed is uh, you know, we had a long stretch of relatively poor food, and we didn't get any immigrants. And then the food situation started to improve, and we've had a steady stream of immigrants coming in. So, you know, in terms of shopping around, suddenly we have, I don't know, we have the Macy's instead of the Kmart. Yes, I was wondering um, if there are any current theories about why female chimps or indeed female humans may prefer to socialize in smaller groups. Oh, um, so I mean, you know, beyond what, what I generally talked about today, uh, they seem to not uh, not be able to handle the effort of taking, of making the investment. So, so some of the um, child psychologists um, have found that, that, for instance, maintaining a friendship for a woman is a really big deal. So it requires constant reinforcement. Uh, you got to call each other all the time if you're besties. Um, and if you haven't called each other for, for a few months, that's a big problem. Whereas men don't have a problem with this, you know. Anybody's ever planned a wedding and the groom starts to invite these people you've never heard of? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, they're my best friends. Yeah. Haven't spoken to them since college. So, so really that kind of thing has been shown experimentally in looking at, in, at, at human friendships, uh, that there's, there's just a completely different dynamic. And I think, you know, if we look at the, the chimpanzees, evolutionarily, there's, there's just a lot more experience with having um, a really varied relationship with other, with other men uh, versus women with other women. I think that, you know, this whole idea of being able to fight and then have a beer together is, is just strained for women. <laughs> Thanks for the question. If I understood correctly, it seemed like the migration or the emigration of the females was maybe designed uh, evolutionarily to increase genetic diversity. And if that's the case, and the immigrants, emigrants rather, are being rejected by the new groups, don't you, isn't there a danger of lack of genetic diversity and eventual genetic problems in the individual groups? Well, it, it's not that it's preventing them from doing so. Um, you know, I think we've got to think about evolution as being every man for himself. So for the females that are, that are in these new communities, uh, their best interest is to keep the new girl out, uh, regardless of the effect it has for the, that species. The interest of the males there is our, the, the interest for the males is to get a, get a new mate. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's preventing uh, genetic diversity in that sense. So it doesn't, ge doesn't generate inbreeding, if you will? Um, they seem to be able to avoid inbreeding somewhat. So, you know, we, we have these females that don't leave. Uh, and they manage, they do mate with their brothers, I got to say. They mate with their brothers, but they, they, they don't do so extensively. Um, <laughs> there are other males that they are not related to, so they have less of a choice. Um, you know, it's, I think it's a, it's a really important issue. Um, but, but yeah. <laughs> 
Any other questions? Thank you so much for the good questions.